outback Queensland before. Maybe to towns like Richmond or Winton or even Isisford, if you've even heard of it. It's a place of red dirt and grassy plains rolling up to rocky outcrops, scrubby green trees, days of searing heat and summer flooding rain. But drought can strike hard and rivers run dry. Now, I want to describe an outback Queensland that might seem a little otherworldly or alien to you or I. The weather is warm and wet. There are great wide rivers flowing down from volcanic mountains to the east. Horsetails grow on the riverbanks near giant conifer forests. Ferns and ginkgos and flowering plants cover the undergrowth. And little towns like Isisford are now prime beachfront real estate where you can watch the sun set over a gigantic inland sea to the west. This is outback Queensland 100 million years ago. There was a huge inland ocean called the Aramanga Sea that covered what is outback Queensland now, as well as parts of the Northern Territory and northern parts of South Australia and New South Wales. And this ocean was teeming with life. There were crustaceans and mollusks and spiral-shelled ammonites, turtles and fish and sharks, as well as huge marine reptiles, plesiosaurs with their long necks, pliosaurs with their huge jaws full of sharp teeth, and ichthyosaurs, the ones that look a little bit like dolphins. But perhaps even stranger than these leviathans of the deep would be the sight of dinosaurs roaming the landscape. Sauropods with their long necks, the long tails, theropods, the meat-eating ones that ran about on two legs. Smaller dinosaurs scurrying underfoot as pterosaurs flew in the sky alongside birds. And giant bulldog-faced fish swam the rivers with tiny, relatively tiny crocodilians, only about a metre in length. We know that these animals lived in and around the Aramanga Sea 100 million years ago because we've found their fossilised remains in outback Queensland. Some of these fossils are beautifully preserved, nearly entire skeletons with all their bones in place, where others are just a scrap of bone here and there, badly preserved and weathered. So why is that? Why are we finding some fossils that are really, really well preserved and other fossils that are just a scrap of bone? Why do paleontologists so often have to reconstruct an entire animal from just one bone or an entire plant from a single leaf? We can find out through the science of taphonomy. Taphonomy is the study of the decay of organic remains and their eventual burial, the transfer of organic remains from the biosphere to the lithosphere. Paleontologists, as well as archaeologists and forensic scientists, all use taphonomy in their work. And the interest in how animals decay, and particularly humans, is not restricted just to its scientific study. Between the 13th and 19th centuries, Japanese Buddhist monks would meditate over the decaying corpses of humans to contemplate the frailty of life and repulsiveness of the human form. And these were often illustrated in kuzozu, which were nine panels depicting a person's life just before they died, and then how the body decayed. And you can see in the panel, in the panels above, that the bodies can start to swell and bloat, and this is because bacteria that normally lives inside your body quite happily digesting food starts to cannibalise the body after death moving along bone marrow and blood vessels and producing gases as a byproduct, causing the body to swell. And as flesh continues to decay, scavengers might be attracted to that body until nothing is left but a few bones to be buried. And as taphonomists and paleontologists specifically, when we're looking at a fossil, it's like we're starting with the final panel of that painting and trying to work our way back through the decay process to try to figure out what that animal looked like in life. 
But this can be hindered by taphonomic processes, such as scavengers coming to visit a carcass. If they remove not only muscle and skin, but also bone and crush it into splinters, then it will be very poorly preserved, if not at all. An animal's body, as it lays on the soil, produces a pulse of nutrients that go into the ground and creates a lush cadaver decomposition island, which is a little macabre, but fantastic for plant life and for fungal growth and for insects. But eventually that body will be completely recycled into the soil and nothing will be left to fossilize. And even if by chance an animal's remains can be buried and fossilized, they then have to survive for millions of years deep in the Earth's crust under high pressure and high temperature. And this often distorts fossils and warps them out of shape. These processes are called taphonomic bias because it biases our understanding of the fossil record and what past ecosystems looked like. But paleontologists and archaeologists and forensic scientists will always include at least a brief consideration for taphonomic bias before they go on to try to interpret ancient ecologies or morphologies, shapes of animals. For example, if you find a pile of bones, fossilized bones together, you might think, okay, this represents a group of animals that were living together and died at the same time in the same environment. But what if some of those bones were actually washed in from far away during a flood event, for example? Now, that pile of bones represents animals that lived at the same time, but lived in different environments. And what if some of those bones are actually much older and may have already been fossilized, eroded out of an outcrop and washed down during the same flood event? And now that pile of bones represents animals that not only lived in different environments, but lived at completely different times. And taphonomic bias also extends to modern day processes like weathering from water and erosion and human interaction with remains as well. When we pick up fossils from the field, we might miss something and that will bias our understanding of whether a species existed in that place or didn't. And anyone who has been to the UK, to the farming regions of the UK and has an interest in archeology span might know that there are sometimes Roman ruins that can be buried just below the topsoil, about 10 or 20 centimetres down. But the, the tines on a plough, as a farmer ploughs their paddock, the pointed part, can tear lines through beautiful mosaic floors. I actually grew up on a farm in Western Australia, but I was always really jealous of those kids who got to discover archaeological ruins or fossil dinosaur bones on their farms in other parts of the world. I was a bit of a dinosaur-obsessed kid. Um, the closest I got to ever finding my own dinosaur fossil was to pick up a dead sheep bone and pretend that was a dinosaur fossil. <laughs> and I would, I would collect these whenever I found them, mainly the skulls because they seemed to be the most interesting, and I would bring them back to our house and store them in a little shed nearby in my own miniature museum, much to my parents' annoyance. I wasn't really interested in the bones beyond collecting them and putting them in that shed because they weren't actually dinosaurs after all. But I, I still remember being really annoyed one time when I was riding in a tractor alongside my father and he was ploughing a paddock and we came across a sheep skeleton lying in the tractor's path and he just drove right over the top of it. And I, you know, well, it makes sense. Why would you try to deviate around a long dead sheep when you can till its bones back into the soil? But try telling that to a 10 year old who wants to collect more fossils. I think a part of me, I knew they weren't dinosaur fossils, of course, but I think a part of me wanted to protect these bones that I was finding to stop taphonomic processes from happening and stop them being weathered and broken apart and run over by a tractor. And what is a fossilization process but that? Protecting organic remains in perpetuity by encasing them in stone or turning them to stone themselves. We can continue to think of taphonomic processes biasing our idea of the fossil record in the negative light. But 
while they do destroy organic remains, they can also leave evidence behind of the environment in which an animal lived and died. The great thing about bone, for example, is that it is quite tough, so it fossilizes much more readily than, say, skin or other soft tissues. But it's also relatively soft. You can scratch it and scrape it and break it. So as taphonomists, it's our job to look at the scratches and scrapes and marks on bones and the way that the bones are positioned themselves and try to decipher what that means for the environment that that animal was living and dying in. It's almost like a palimpsest, an ancient manuscript that's had its original text erased and then been written over the top of again and erased again. We're trying to read these multiple messages and decode what was going on. Now, as far as the animals that I was telling you about that lived in ancient Queensland 100 million years ago, we've found their fossil remains in ocean deposits of the Aramanga Sea and also in rivers and lakes. But again, we come to that question of why we find some fossils that are really well preserved and some that are just scraps of bone. And when we looked at this more closely, we found that the Fossils that were really well preserved were found closer to the town of Isisford, and the ones that weren't as well preserved were found closer to the town of Winton. And we did some testing of zircon minerals to date those rocks, and found that they're actually about six to eight million years in age difference. So the Isisford fossils are actually six to eight million years older. But the assumption was still that they were buried in a similar environment. Just the difference in time wouldn't necessarily change the taphonomic signature if they were both buried in lakes and rivers, for example. But with mineral testing of calcite grains that were growing around the fossils at Isisford, we found a brackish water signature. So not fresh water of lakes and rivers, but a more a mixed saltwater and freshwater signature, and that told us that these animals were actually living in a river delta much closer to the Aramanga Sea, where salt water could come upriver with the changing tides. And now I want to think about what this means for the exploration of other planets into the future and how taphonomy can help us understand whether life exists on any other planets at all. NASA are planning to send people to Mars by 2033 and SpaceX might get there even sooner. And with boots on the ground, I think that our chance of finding fossil remains of microbes, if they're there at all, will greatly increase. But the Mars rover is already looking for traces of microbial life on Mars. And at the Gale Crater, we know that there was a lake groundwater stream system. And we have similar types of rocks preserved on Earth that we can compare and contrast what fossils should look like in these types of rocks. But even with the fossils that we find on Earth, it's really hard to distinguish between organic and inorganic traces. And as far as modern taphonomic processes on Mars go, any fossil that is exposed at the surface is exposed to cosmic radiation that might degrade organic molecules, and then we can't test those rocks and find any trace of any life being there at all. And this got me to thinking as well, if we are sending people to Mars, if we successfully land on the surface of the planet and colonize it or stay in space stations surrounding that planet, what are we going to do with our dead? Is there going to be a blanket rule that everybody has to be cremated? Or can people choose to be buried? Does it matter if we introduce our own microbial life into the dead soil of another planet? Because the funeral rites and rituals that we have are inextricably tied with the environments that are here on Earth. A Tibetan sky burial where a person's body is left out for scavengers to eat and be nourished will have very little meaning on a Martian landscape where there are no scavengers. But for the Turayan people of Sulawesi, who put their dead into crypts and let their bodies mummify, and then bring them back out every few years to have a second funeral or manene. They clean the bodies off and redress them in their favorite clothing. It might actually be advantageous to put bodies in crypts on Mars. They'll mummify and stay that way for a long time. 
I think our ideas about what is natural and normal as far as decay is concerned is going to change a lot as we start to explore other planets. I'd like to finish with this quote from Jeanette Winterson from Wait, the Myth of Atlas and Heracles, which speaks to me as to why taphonomy is so important and what it can teach us, and particularly taphonomic bias. Earth is ancient now, but all knowledge is stored up in her. She keeps a record of everything that has happened since time began. Of time before time, she says little, and in a language that no one has yet understood. Through time, her secret codes have gradually been broken. Her mud and lava is a message from the past. Of time to come, she says much, but who listens? Thank you.